Hello guys, I'm Lauren Smith and I'm studying a degree in theoretical physics. I'll be bringing you through to 2021's higher level question 7 today, which is a mechanics question involving a lot of thinking. So we better get going. So let's begin by stating the three laws as asked for in parts 1, 2 and 3. In part 1 we are asked to state Newton's second law of motion me giving a top tip in always highlighting the keywords in the question. We're asked for the second law, so you can either answer this with verbal or mathematical notation or even a little bit of both. I'm just going to give the two separately. So in verbal notation, i.e. the first way you can answer this question, is the definition as follows. When an external force acts on a body, the rate of change of the body's momentum is directly proportional to the force. That's the definition in full. And where do you pick up your three marks? So to be awarded your first three marks, you have to explicitly state that the force is directly proportional to something. That gives you three. And the second three is by stating that what it is proportional to is, of course, the rate of change of the body's momentum, giving you your full six marks. OK, so now we're going to look at the mathematical notation. The second way in which you can attain your full six marks is, of course, by stating the formula that gives you three marks and you need to notate the formula, i.e. what do all of these variables up here stand for? And this might be a little bit easier in the exam if you were to, say, directly point to each variable, say, write the formula down and point an arrow to it and label each variable. Say, for example, here I'm going to do an external force. I just type them out explicitly just as a revision tool for you guys. But that would be my tip in the exam. And that's a perfect way of notating it as well. So, OK, so in part two, we're asked to state... The principle of conservation of momentum. Again, you can write this in verbal or mathematical notation. In verbal notation, the first version, you basically are awarded marks for saying the following definition in full. And that gives you three marks. I'd like to draw your attention to the phrase closed system and that this interaction that I'm describing here in the definition, the momentum exchange between two bodies, it is in a closed system, so no external forces are, in fact, at play here. It's, we're just specifically looking at a collision between two or more bodies. And this is basically described here in this equation here. Now, just stating the equation or just plucking it out of the formula and tables book, which you can fully do, will not get you full marks. Of course, you're going to have to notate it. So you get three marks for the notation and for the formula. And in part three, we are asked to state the principle of conservation of energy, one of the most important laws in physics, which states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can only be converted from one form to another. This statement will get you three marks. Okay, so on to the more calculations oriented part of the question. We are told that an object A of mass 45 grams is traveling at a horizontal speed of 6.2 meters per second. And it strikes a resting sphere B of mass 80 grams. We're told that the string, which you can see over here, is 1.2 meters above the center of B. So we have a collision and the two particles are in contact for... 25 milliseconds and the recoil velocity of a we are told is 1.1 meters per second and the next six parts of this question we will need to use this information so let's begin before delving into part four of the section of our question we will be using the formula f is equal to ma and v is equal to u plus at on page 50 of the formula and tables book. Part 4 asks us to calculate the force exerted by B on A. What force does A experience during this collision? So I have a diagram that I've drawn here. You don't actually have to draw out diagrams in the exam. You won't get any extra marks for it. But I always feel that especially in mechanics, you need to visualize the problem. So even drawing a small diagram or a sketch 
to look at the problem visually, it can really, really help. So that would be my biggest tip during the exam. So the diagram here before me of before and after the collision, we have that A is originally traveling to the left. And I've given the original velocity of A a plus sign. Signs are very important with velocity, as we know, because velocity is a vector and therefore it depends on direction as well as magnitude. But A then after the collision at T is equal to 25 milliseconds. B has its own trajectory. It goes off in a pendulum motion and A changes direction. And this change in direction means that we have a change in sign of the velocity. And it's very important to have this minus sign in. So notice that the initial velocity is greater than the final velocity. Therefore, we have deceleration. And this makes sense as A is imparting some kinetic energy on to B. So some of A's original velocity is going to be given to B. and Therefore, its own velocity reduces after the collision. So how are we going to tackle this problem? Well, we're going to tackle it with the two formulae I showed earlier. F is equal to MA and A is equal to V minus U over T. We can substitute A into our first formula to give us this expression here over to the right, which was our original Newton's second law, which we saw in part one of this section of our question. However, we are not dealing with acceleration explicitly. We're dealing with deceleration because the original velocity is greater than the final velocity. Therefore, we're going to have a change in sign as what's in the bracket here will overall be a minus. So, but we can change our formula as follows to give us an overall positive force exerted on A. This formula down here will get you your three marks. So we have all of our variables down here. We're going to have to change or convert the mass into SI units because it's in grams and we need it in kilograms. Dividing by 1,000, which is the conversion rate, we get the mass of A is equal to 0 0.045 kilograms. Now, also, the time interval of the collision is not in SI units. It's in milliseconds, and we would like it in seconds. Again, dividing through by 1,000, we get that the time interval is actually 0 0.025 seconds. Notice when I also wrote down the velocities, I included the signs. So there's no ambiguity when we go to substitute all these values into this formula. Now I've just substituted everything into our force formula. Be really, really careful here with your minus signs. I'll show you how to input this into the calculator so that you will absolutely cause no confusion to yourself or the calculator to make an error. Make sure that you put in your minus sign for the velocity and include brackets. So putting this into our calculator, Remember, please include brackets because as follows, we have up here minus minus 1.1. We don't want a syntax error here. And now the calculator knows what order the operations need to go in. And computing a result, we get that the force is equal to 13.14 newtons not forgetting your units. Now, substituting this in here, or explicitly stating your answer here, will get you your final three marks. Before moving on to part five of the section of our question, I would like to draw your attention to the following formula, which we will use, i.e. the conservation of momentum, which you can find on page 51 of the formula and tables book. I told you we'd come back to this. So in part five, we're asked to calculate the maximum velocity of B. So what does maximum velocity actually mean? It means that all of the energy imparted by A on B is purely kinetic energy. So we don't have any friction or any, or any other dissipative forces going on. It's a pure conversion and we are going to use the momentum law. So stating that the momentum before the interaction between the two bodies is equal to the momentum afterwards. We use this formula because we know all the masses of A and B. We also know the initial velocities of A, B, and the final velocity of A. And we need to find V sub B, i.e. 
the maximum velocity. But we can simplify this formula right down because B, we were told, was at rest. So the initial velocity of B is zero. So we can neglect this term completely to get this. All we need to do now is substitute in. Now writing down the mass of A in kilograms as we calculated in the previous part of the question. Now B we are told is 80 grams. Carrying out a similar conversion to kilograms for SI units, we get that the mass of B is equal to 0 0.08 kilograms. Now just writing down all of our other values, making sure that we explicitly do not forget the signs of the velocities of A. And this is our target variable here, the velocity of B. And here we have the final substituted version into our formula. Doing this gives you three marks. Now let's put our values into our calculator. So on the left we have 0 0.045 times 6.2, which gives us 0 0.279. And on the right we have 0 0.045 times minus 1.1, not forgetting that minus sign giving us minus 0 0.0495. Adding both sides by our constant term on the right, we can now divide through by 0 0.08 in order to get V. Inputting this into our calculator, we get that the velocity is approximately 4.11 meters per second, giving us our final three marks. Notice that the velocity of B, or the maximum velocity, is positive. Therefore, it is moving to the left because we defined the right for negative velocities direction. Okay, so before moving on to the next part of this question, we're going to turn to page 51 in our formula and tables book. And we were going to be looking in particular at the formula for centripetal force. F is equal to mv squared over r. Now moving on to part six, we are asked to find the magnitude and direction of the maximum centripetal force on B. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to look at the direction. As you can see to my right, the pendulum with mass B as the bob makes B travel in circular motion, hence B having a centripetal force. Therefore, the tension of the rope is going to pull B inwards towards the point P, which will be the center of the circular motion as it travels to the left. So the direction in which B will be traveling in is towards P. And stating that will get you your first two marks. Now let's move on to calculating the magnitude of the force. And we are going to use the formula, which we looked at on page 51 of our formula and tables books. F is equal to mv squared over r, where m is the mass of the object traveling in circular motion, r is the radius of our circular motion, and v is the linear speed, which I have indicated in the diagram to the right. My biggest tip to you would always put down the formula. Don't directly substitute in your values into the formula, because just Stating this formula or copying it down directly from the formula in tables books will get you three marks. So you can see to my right that the radius of the circle is 1.2 meters. The linear speed is 4.11 meters per second, as we figured out in previous parts of the question. We also know from the question that the mass of B is equal to 0 0.08 kilograms. Now we can sub everything in and calculate the magnitude of the force. Now I've substituted everything in. Let's put it all into our calculator. Having the calculator up here, we do have a lot of brackets, which I would encourage you to use since we have powers involved and we would like to make sure that the calculator knows exactly what it's calculating and to make zero mistakes. Pressing enter, we have our answer for the force, which I will round to three decimal places. If you don't forget your units, i.e., we use newtons for the force units, you will get your final three marks. And the answer for the force is going to be 1.126 newtons in magnitude. Now we're going to take another look at the formula in tables book. We're going to be using it a lot in this question. We're going to turn to page 55 under the title energy and work because we will be working with energy in the next section of our question. 
In particular, we will be looking at the potential energy and also the kinetic energy. Okay, so moving on to part seven, we are going to find the maximum height gained by B. The concept in this question is that maximum height automatically implies all kinetic energy. And you can see this in pendulum motion where the bob or the object, B in this case, when it reaches maximum height, it stops for a brief second, completely slows down before it accelerates back when it goes to repeat its cycle. And therefore, at equilibrium position, it has its maximum speed, which means we have all kinetic energy. Due to the conservation of energy, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it only can be converted from one form to another. All of this kinetic energy in the cycle must be converted to potential energy. And we saw what the formulas for potential energy and kinetic energy were in the formula tables book. Since we have gone from an equilibrium position of all kinetic energy to a maximum height position of all potential energy, we have successfully converted all kinetic energy to potential energy and thus we can equate these two formulae, giving us mgh is equal to half mv squared. Now, as I said before in previous parts of the question, it is extremely important to always stay all of the formulas relevant in coming to your conclusions, like we have done so here in this line. And for stating any of these formulas, you're going to pick up three marks. Okay, on to the calculation. Rewriting the equation we had earlier, we can see that we don't need the mass because we have a mass on either side so we can just divide them out and if we rearrange the formula just to have the height on its own because that's the variable that we want to find our target variable we get the expression h is equal to v squared over 2g now we know the values for v and g i have just written them to the right i think that's also a very very good idea just to write the values of all of the variables you use in each part of the question, just to let the examiner know where you're coming from. And we also have the value for the acceleration due to gravity at the very, very end of our question. We're told that. So now all we have to do is substitute in our values and get the maximum height. Now let's take out our calculator and substitute in our values. Again, since we have powers here, it is best to use brackets. And we have our answer for h, 0 0.86 meters. I'm going to round two decimal places, not forgetting our units, of course. And our final answer will get you three marks. So for part eight of this section of our question, we are asked to find the maximum angular displacement of the string. Maximum angular displacement corresponds to when the bob, as you can see in the diagram on the right here that I've drawn, to the bob's maximum height and this is why it's very important to draw your diagrams especially for mechanics because it can really help you to visualize the physical scenario of the question and really this is all about trigonometry now we have a target variable which i'm going to label as alpha you can name the angle in here as any angle you like i'm going to call it alpha and this is corresponding to when the bob is at maximum height. And this is just really trigonometry because we have information for the hypotenuse here I have in purple and the adjacent, which I have in green, which is just the difference between the height h at maximum height and the length of the rope 1.2. I got this information because when the ball was static before it came in contact with a, it was just in equilibrium, not moving. And the length of the rope was from P to the center of mass of the ball. We have information for the hypotenuse, which I'm going to label H. And also the adjacent, which I'll label capital A. And that is the difference between H and 1.2. And we know that H is equal to 0 0.86. And really, because we have information for the hypotenuse and the adjacent, we can only use the cosine identity, which is... The cosine of the angle is equal to the adjacent of the hypotenuse. With the cosine of the angle, alpha, our target variable is equal to the adjacent of the hypotenuse, which you can sub in as follows. Now, rearranging and substituting in our value for h. Now, getting our calculator out. We have 
that the cosine of the angle is equal to 0 0.283 reoccurring, but as it's in fraction form, I'd always put down the full fraction value, i.e. 17 over 60. That's another tip that I have for you, so that when you get your final answer, it's the full unrounded answer. Now, using this, we have cosine inverse to 17 over 60, which is equal to, and remembering that your calculator is in degrees or radians, but if it is in radians, you need to specify that. I'd always put it in degrees for the physics exam, unless it specifically states otherwise, which I don't believe it will. But keeping this value up on screen, because this will be stored as an answer. And there we have our maximum angular displacement of 73.54 degrees. Making sure that you're stating that, yes, I am using degrees. Where will you pick up marks in this question? You will pick up marks for using the cosine identity. That's three marks. And for also your final answer. For part nine, and we're nearly done this question, we're asked to draw a label diagram. Very important. To show the forces acting on B when it's at its maximum height. Well, there are only two forces when B is at its maximum height. At maximum height, obviously, we have the tension in the rope, which I've labelled T, and we have W, i.e. the weight, which is just the object's B, in this case, tendency to be attracted to the Earth with acceleration due to gravity. That's the weight. And for each correct label, you shall get three marks. The tension acts as the centripetal force in this question, which makes the bob oscillate along this circular path. If I draw it here, it goes back and forth like that. Going back to the actual question itself, we're giving a little bit more information. We are told that the string is cut at the instant B is at maximum height. And we are asked what is the magnitude and direction of the acceleration of B after the string is cut. So what will happen then? The ball will be completely free from the tension in the rope. And so the only force acting on it will be the force of gravity or its weight, i.e. downwards. So the direction will be downwards, three marks, and the magnitude will be 9.8 meters per second per second because force with Newton's second law is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration. And the acceleration of the object's weight is just going to be the acceleration due to gravity, which we have been told at the end of our question in the exam paper is 9.8 meters per second per second.